Hello, and welcome to Kindred. We're so glad you're here. My name is Ty, and I'm the worship leader. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we want you to know that no matter what your faith journey looks like, no matter what your background is, you are welcome here at Kindred. If you are new, click connect in the video description below, and we can answer any questions that you may have and help you find your place in our community. Also, if you'd like to see this week's announcements, you can click announcements below and we'll keep you up to speed on all the many things we've got going on. Finally, if you'd like to give to Kindred today, just click give in the video description below because we're able to provide all of our ministries for free because of generous donors like you. So thank you for participating in financial generosity. Once again, we're so glad you're here and we hope you enjoy this service. Lord, I offer up this rebel heart So stubborn and so restless from the start I don't want to fight you anymore So take this rebel heart and make it yours Father, I no longer want to run You've broken my resistance with your love And drowned it underneath the crimson spill So bend this rebel heart into your will I give it all over to you I give it all over to you your love is like a narrow straight and true and now this rebel heart belongs to you help me lay the renegade to rest Turn the stone inside me back to flesh And hold me till my best defenses fall And watch this rebel heart surrender all And I give it all over to you I give it all Your love is like a narrow, straight and true And now this rebel heart belongs to you Take my life and let it be Yours Take my life and let it be yours lord take my life and let Rebel heart belongs to you. And now this rebel heart belongs to you. And now this rebel heart belongs to you. Belongs to you. 
Well, hello and welcome to Kindred. It's good to be with you. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Daniel. I'm the pastor here. And if this is your first time to tune in with us at Kindred, we're especially glad that you have tuned in. Uh, today, we've got a special treat. We're going to hear a sermon from our summer intern. His name is Jonathan Sobel. Uh, Jonathan is a Duke Divinity School student. He's a, a pastor in training, and uh, we're excited to, to hear him preach. So I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan now. I'm Jonathan Sobel. Until a few years ago, I was a computer scientist, a programmer, a software architect. Currently, though, I'm a graduate student, again, at Duke Divinity School, where I am two-thirds of the way through the three-year Master of Divinity program, which is a prerequisite for being ordained, as Pastor Daniel is, in the United Methodist Church. I'm going to begin by reading our scripture today. I'm going to read from two different things. First, our psalm for the day is Psalm 31. And I'm going to read starting at verse 9. Have mercy on me, Lord, because I'm depressed. My vision fails because of my grief, as do my spirit and my body. My life is consumed with sadness. My years are consumed with groaning. Strength fails me because of my suffering. My bones dry up. I'm a joke to all my enemies, still worse to my neighbors. I scare my friends, and whoever sees me in the street runs away. I'm forgotten, like I'm dead, completely out of mind. I'm like a piece of pottery, destroyed. Yes, I've heard all the gossiping, terror all around. So many gang up together against me. They plan to take my life. But me? I trust you, Lord. I affirm you are my God. My future is in your hands. Don't hand me over to my enemies, to all who are out to get me. Shine your face on your servant. Save me by your faithful love. Bless the Lord because he has wondrously revealed his faithful love to me when I was like a city under siege. When I was panicked, I said, I'm cut off from your eyes, but you heard my request for mercy when I cried out to you for help. All you who are faithful love the Lord. The Lord protects those who are loyal, but he pays back the proud to the fullest degree. All you who wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage. And then our gospel for the day is from Matthew 26, starting at verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to the disciples, stay here while I go and pray over there. When he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, he began to feel sad and anxious. Then he said to them, I'm very sad. It's as if I'm dying. Stay here and keep alert with me. Then he went a short distance farther and fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it's possible, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. He came back to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Couldn't you stay alert one hour with me? Stay alert and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. A second time he went away and prayed, My father, if it's not possible that this cup be taken away unless I drink it, then let it be what you want. Again he came and found them sleeping. Their eyes were heavy with sleep. But he left them and again went and prayed the same words for the third time. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Will you sleep and rest all night? Look, the time has come for the human one to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Look, here comes my betrayer. And then it continues with Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. O oh God, let my words be heard, but let the words really be heard from you and not from me. Amen. I'm going to be up front with you and admit that when the pastors told me there was going to be this seven-week series on the seven deadly sins this summer, I was not thrilled. And then when I found out that I was going to be preaching on sloth, I was really not thrilled. 
For one thing, among the great diversity of sins in the world, sloth doesn't seem that bad. I mean, okay, so you slept in this morning. Eh. What's more, not being slothful seems not so much about accomplishing anything in particular for God. It just seems like it's about being a good and virtuous person. And I understand we're supposed to be good and virtuous people, but to what end? I mean, sorry, I'm the kid who, when someone said something, said why and just because wasn't a good enough answer. So, honestly, I'd rather talk about sloths than sloth. Did you know sloths are really misunderstood animals? The little furry guys that hang around in trees and move very slowly in South America. Um, sloths, I mean, did you know that they can swim really well? Um, most of the reason that we think of them as being just sleeping all the time and never doing anything is that they're actually nocturnal. And then at night, they move around, they patrol their territory, they eat some more leaves. In fact, many sloths only sleep nine or 10 hours a day, which isn't much more than we sleep. And yet lions who sleep, say, be 20 hours a day get called the king of the jungle and sloths get called by the name of one of the seven deadly sins. Sloths are just really misunderstood. But maybe the sin of sloth is just as misunderstood as the animal sloth. There are so many things that go wrong when we try to think about the sin of sloth. I think of it as trying to make our way down a path of understanding, and there keep being these side paths that curve off away from it, and we mistake the side paths for the main path. Today, we're going to peer around some of these corners to the side paths and see what sloth isn't. Uh, on our way to trying to understand sloth as a sin and learning to repent of it. The first big misunderstanding we have to clear up right away is this. I joked about sleeping in, but resting is not the sin of sloth. Resting is not sinful, period. We Americans are especially prone to thinking that it's somehow godly to go, 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 and never stop. We think if we take a break, we're being lazy and, well, slothful. It's baked into our culture that the difference between successful and unsuccessful is working a little harder. And what's worse, we start to think that being monetarily successful means being more valuable, and being less monetarily successful means being a less valuable human being. But then we've wandered into a completely different sin, because devaluing people is sinful. The fact that one person worked a little less hard or was even a little less lucky and ended up with a little less stuff doesn't make them a less valuable human being. Everyone is valuable in the eyes of God. That includes people who take a break and rest. In fact, resting is biblical and holy. Right alongside the Bible statements about not committing murder and not stealing and not cheating are things about the requirement for not going and going and going without stopping. There is Sabbath rest, and the requirement is really unambiguous and straightforward. It even says that when God created the universe, part of that was God rested. Now, I don't really honestly understand what that means. God didn't go on a vacation and become unreachable for a while. But the Bible says that God rests. So resting cannot be the sin of sloth. Resting is good and holy. Well, suppose we steer clear of kind of pop understandings of sloth and move a little farther down the path and take a more academic perspective. If we see the sloth on our list of seven deadly sins, we might have used a more formal academic word for sloth. It's acedia, which in turn comes from the Greek word akedia. What does akedia mean? Well, one translation of it is depression. And here's where we should recognize we might be headed on a different wrong path. Sadness is not sin. Let me say that again. That is important. Sadness is not sin. The Bible not only celebrates joy and happiness, it also models lament. 
our psalm for today, Psalm 31, as an example. The speaker in this psalm is being really honest about the experience of sadness. I read earlier, Have mercy on me, God, because I'm depressed. My vision fails because of my grief, as do my spirit and my body. My life is consumed with sadness. My years are consumed with groaning. Strength fails me because of my suffering. My bones dry up. The poetry here is intense, and the person saying these things is clearly not happy. But being sad for a while is not being sinful. It's being a healthy participant in the real world. There are things in the world to be sad about, and that's okay. And then there's chronic depression. Chronic depression is not a sin either. Chronic depression is an illness. And while the church may have a role to play alongside psychologists and medical doctors in treating chronic depression, we do not point a finger at someone who's depressed and say, you sinner. The Gospel of John says that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to heal it. If you feel depressed occasionally, that's normal. If you feel like you can't stop being depressed, tell someone, talk to your doctor, get help which is also normal. God wants us to be healthy. So if sloth is a sin, then whatever it is, it's not the same thing as depression. But remember that I said depression is just one of the translations of Akedia. I want to come back and look at that word again and return to the realm of doctors and medicine, but I want to put all that on a kind of imaginary shelf right here for a minute. So we're going to set the technical words and medicine and things right about here. Just remember it's sitting there. We're going to come back to it. And let's take a little intermission and ask ourselves, is this problem of heading down the wrong path, is it especially hard with sloth? Is sloth just hard to talk about compared to the other sins? I think so. I mean, look at the others. There's pride, envy, wrath, greed, gluttony, lust, For every one of them, we can say something like, don't be prideful, don't be envious, don't be wrathful, don't lust. What about sloth? The problem is that you already don't something. So what do we say? Don't, don't, stop don'ting. It doesn't make any sense. It's really hard to issue a prohibition against not doing something. And really, not doing things doesn't seem so bad, does it? I told my teenage daughter that I was going to be talking about sloth of the seven deadly sins. And she said, and I quote, Ooh, sloth is the best sin because if nobody ever does anything, they can't do anything wrong. (laughs) You can understand why she might say that. You look around at the world and you see a lot of people doing a lot of wrong. If a lot more people did a lot less, They might do a lot less harm to each other. They might do less harm to themselves. They might do less harm to the earth. Maybe we have it backwards. Maybe not doing is a virtue instead of a vice. But really, we've wandered off the path again. In Methodism, we have something called the general rules. And we like to keep it simple, so they're just three parts. Part one, first, do no harm. Oh, you might have thought that was part, the beginning of the Hippocratic Oath. People make that mistake. Actually, that is part of the Methodist rule. And it begins with doing no harm. When John Wesley first wrote down the general rules for Methodist societies way back in the 1700s, he gave examples of harmful practices. Things like, things not to do, like disrespecting God or speaking evil of someone or borrowing without the intention of ever repaying someone. And Wesley also, remember this is the 1700s, a century before the U.S. Civil War, included in things we should not do, owning and buying and selling slaves, because slavery is harm. But the Methodist rules don't end there. The first part is do no harm, but there are parts two and part three, and they reorient us back on the path again. Part one, do no harm. Part two, do good. Do good to people's bodies, do good to people's souls. That means feeding people who are hungry. That means healing the illnesses of people who are sick. That means visiting people who are in prison. It also means fixing the systems that keep people hungry and sick and incarcerated. It means doing good and caring for one another, physically, spiritually, really caring about each other's well-being. 
Part three of the general rules is attend to the ordinances of God by worshiping together, reading and studying the Bible, praying and sharing in Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. The important thing is that part one is only part one. Doing harm, or not doing harm rather, is just the beginning. The sin of sloth is stopping at part one. Doing no harm is important. I don't mean to make light of it, but we can't stop there. We have to do good. And I think of part three as doing the things that empower and nourish us to keep doing good. Okay, end of intermission. Let's take back down our fancy words and talking about doctors again for a minute. I'm going to bring that back up. I think we're ready to sort of move on towards the end of the path here now. The ancient form of the Hippocratic Oath actually does include some language about not doing harm. Buried down in the middle, there's, I will do no harm or injustice to my patients. I wish we'd put more emphasis on the injustice part. In another clause, it says, I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm. But in the modernized Hippocratic Oath, used by many medical schools now, there's another phrase that takes us farther down the path of understanding sloth. The oath taken by many doctors since the 1960s includes this phrase. I will apply, for the benefit of the sick, all measures that are required, avoiding the twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. What's therapeutic nihilism? That's saying they're just going to get sick again. And everyone dies in the end. Why try to heal this person? What's the point? Why bother? I said before that one of the translations of Akadea is depression, but a more literal one is not caring because you've given up. In a word, despair. You see, the patient may lose hope, but the doctor is not allowed to give up on behalf of the patient. And as Christians, we are called to be healers. For us, choosing despair is not an option. And the sin of sloth at its heart is choosing despair. That's why it's a sin. It's a choice that says, why bother? Okay, I think I've put off dealing with today's gospel about as long as possible. Procrastination isn't quite the same as sloth, right? You see, one of the things I ask whenever I read something in the Bible is, why is this here? Now, I don't mean why did this happen or what does this mean, But given the limited space and the fact that the printing press hadn't been invented yet, why did this writer decide that this was important enough to preserve for posterity? Why did Christians for all time need to know this thing? Well, in today's story, I understand why Matthew would decide to include the part about Jesus praying. It communicates both Jesus' awareness of what's about to happen his very human desire to avoid suffering, and his faithfulness to God and to who he is. When he says, not my will, but yours. I get all that. The part that seems unnecessary is telling us about the disciples falling asleep and Jesus calling them out for it. It feels like the Gospel of Matthew is just beating up on the disciples. I mean, it's the middle of the night, Jesus leaves them alone, they fall asleep. So what? Here's a really literal translation of Matthew 26, 40. And he comes to the disciples and he finds them sleeping. And he says to Peter, So, weren't you strong enough to stay awake or be alert for me for one hour? Really, Jesus? You're going to call Peter a weakling because he fell asleep at night? This sounds a lot like our very first wrong path. Don't ever stop. Just keep going. Don't sleep. I could say that Matthew is the one that's being mean to the disciples and telling the story, except that it's in Matthew and Mark and Luke. They all thought it was important enough to keep, important enough for all Christians everywhere to know. Why? There are a couple of clues in the text. First, the word the Gospels use for sleeping here can also mean indifferent. Now, I'm not suggesting the translators got it wrong. The disciples probably were asleep, literally. But in the minds of those first writers and readers of this text, Jesus found them kind of sleeping slash not caring. How could they not care? Didn't they understand the gravity, the seriousness of this moment? I I think they did, 
And in Luke's version of the story, he adds an explanation. Luke says, Jesus found them asleep, overcome by grief. They weren't just lazy. They weren't just clueless. They had a sense of what was about to happen. And here's the important part. They didn't think anything they could possibly do would make a difference. When faced with all of this, Jesus responded by praying. The disciples gave up and slept. Jesus was depressed, and he told his friends. He modeled sadness for the disciples. He invited them to support him. And like in our psalm, he offered up his sadness to God. Remember, it said, have mercy on me, God, because I'm depressed. My bones dry up. Jesus invited his disciples to do something with their sadness, and they chose to do nothing. But the heart of this text is in the next verse. And I realized I've been reading this verse wrong my whole life. I was just sure that it said, you didn't stay awake and pray. You've given in to the temptation to sleep. You see how I've internalized this resting is sin fallacy. That's, that's not what Jesus says. If I went back and looked at it and looked at it carefully, in verse 41, Jesus says, stay awake, stay alert, and pray so that you won't give in to, t- not that they have given in to temptation, stay awake, stay alert, and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. I've been asking to what end? And Jesus stops me and looks me in the eye and says, that's what I've been telling you. Sloth is unplugging from God and giving up and letting the evil win. Back in Psalm 31, the writer says, I feel like I am forgotten, like I'm dead, completely out of mind. I'm like a piece of pottery destroyed. But it didn't stay there. The psalm didn't stop there. It continues, but I trust you, Lord. I affirm you are my God. My future is in your hands. Shine your face on your servant. Save me by your faithful love. You see, resting isn't sloth. Sadness isn't sloth. And the opposite of sloth isn't going all the time or being happy all the time. Sloth is choosing despair. And its opposite is choosing hope. Psalm 31 ends, All you who wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage. I think that's what Jesus meant when he was talking to Peter about strength. He didn't mean being strong enough not to sleep. He meant being strong enough to choose courage, strong enough to choose hope. He meant claiming the strength that God offers when we choose hope. Hope is a choice you make. Hope is choosing God's justice and righteousness. Hope is claiming our inheritance as children of God. So, repent of your sloth, stay alert, and pray so that you won't give in to the temptation to give up. All you who wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage and choose hope. Oh God, we offer you our fear of stopping and our fear of going. We offer you our sadness and our depression. Grant us hope enough to refrain from harm hope enough to do good, and hope enough to seek your grace. Please, oh please, grant us the strength and courage to choose hope, so that in the end we choose not our will, but yours. Amen. 
Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for that good word for us. A few uh, quick reminders here for you before we go, friends. First of all, if you're new to Kindred, I would love to connect with you, but I need your contact information in order to do that. So there's a link in the description here that says connect. If you click on that, leave me some contact information. I would love to reach out to you later this week uh, to say hey and answer any questions that you might have about our church. Uh, Also, if you are local, we would love to see you in in in-person worship. Online worship is awesome, uh, no doubt about it, but... uh, There's no substitute for getting together in the same room and worshiping together with other folks in our community. So you can get on our website. It's kindrednc.church and get all the details about when and where to find us in person. Uh, And finally, as always, uh, check out this week's updates. Uh, They're linked in the description below, and that's going to keep you up to date and keep you up to speed on the ways that you can get involved with our community uh, if and when you're ready to do that. Well, with that, friends, uh, we are sent back into the world, back into our lives. We're sent in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember that we love you. We hope you have a great week and may the peace of Christ be with you.